What is up, everybody, and welcome back to Pop Scream, our day full of Halloween-themed panels and fun from your friends at Pop Culture Classroom and Denver Pop Culture Con. I'll be your host for this panel, Matt Slater. You can find me at Maddie Slay on Twitch and Twitter. And today, I am excited to be bringing you a whole herd of guests. We've got three right now. We might have a couple of more popping in as the panel goes and as we get our uh, links working correctly. Um, so... We have creators from Scout Comics, publisher Scout Comics, and we have creators from lots of different series. So first, as I introduce you gentlemen, I would love to, for you guys to tell us what your favorite Halloween treat is. So first from The Electric Black, we have Joe Schmalky. Did I get that correct? Perfect. Yes, yes. And uh, you want us to tell you your, our favorite Halloween treat right now? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, say your favorite Reese's candy. Peanut butter Reese's peanut butter cup. Okay. Excellent. Yep, yep, that's it. There you go. Any specific variation on that or just like the original? No, just the regular. Yep. Just the regular. I, I like them cold. I put them there in the refrigerator go. and I, yeah. Good man. You're a good man. <laughs> um, we also have uh, from Grit, Mr. Oh. Brian Wickman. Hello. Brian, what's your favorite Halloween treat? Uh, I am a three musketeers guy. Ooh, nice. Dark chocolate or Regular. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then from the upcoming comic, Frank at Home on the Farm, we have Jordan Thomas. So, yeah. So in England, we don't really have Halloween style as you guys in the US. I'm a peanut M&M's fan. Myself. Ooh, peanut M&M's. You guys are all picking really good candy. On our last panel, uh, our co-host, uh, my – what – was my friend and was my co-host Tajian picked candy corn. And so now we don't speak to her anymore um, because that is a <laughs> terrible choice. Uh, and then popping in and out, we do have Aaron Crow. Hopefully we'll get him on here, but he is one of the creators of It Eats What Feeds It. So later on, these gentlemen will be telling us all about how they create horror comics. So if you're an aspiring creator or if you just love blood and guts and creepy stuff, uh, stick around to hear from the professionals. But if you are just tuning in, this is Pop Scream, which is a full day of Halloween celebration and panels from your friends at Denver Pop Culture Con and Pop Culture Classroom. We are currently live on uh, Denver Pop Culture Con and Pop Culture Classroom's Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube channels, as well as our weekly shows uh, channels, which is Pop Stream. So if you're watching live, you get to be a part of the show. You get to let your voice be heard and be a part of the community. Um, you can chat with everyone else there. You can feed me questions for our guests um, or just tell us about your favorite Halloween treats and your favorite horror comics. So like I said, if you have questions for these guys, all you have to do is put a comment in whatever platform you are watching on. And then at the end of the panel, I'll be collating those and then asking our guests. And if you enjoy this content, make sure to subscribe to PopStream on YouTube and podcast services and check out some of our previous weekly content. So just yesterday, uh, the AV Club talked about our favorite horror adaptations with guest screenwriter, podcaster, reviewer, and the list goes on and on with her credentials, Michaela Daniels. Um, and of course, we have lots of other great PopStream content throughout the day, excuse me, Pop Scream content. So later on, cosplayer Tara Necessary will be teaching us how to do Halloween makeup that goes with our masks. Um, I will be turning myself into a unicorn for that panel, so tune in for that. Plus, the TV guidance counselor, Ken Reed, will be talking Halloween TV in 1990. We've even got author Stephen Graham Jones talking about his latest books, and then we will be streaming the game Phasmophobia, which I am absolutely terrified of. Um, ooh, I'm not looking forward to it. But that's enough of that. I want to talk horror comics with you guys. So... To start off, we're going to have a little bit of more of an open conversation. So whenever you feel like jumping in, please jump in. And the first question is just, how did you get into comics and specifically horror comics? Where did that love start for you guys? Uh, my first book was a horror comic. Um, a couple of years ago, I started doing, uh, it was more sci-fi horror, but uh, it was called The Calamitous Black Devils. It came out through Broken Icon Comics. And uh, dealt with a lot of like things that I was interested in, which is all like Lovecraftian and uh, mixed with classical universal monsters. And I'm a big history buff, so there was a lot of elements of World War II in there as well. And so that's that's how it all started for me. And I've sort of 
been going down that path ever since. I, I I'm not a big superhero guy. Um, I was always driven to you know creepy magazine and eerie comics and ghostly comics and stuff mm. like that when I was a kid. My favorite superhero is our uh, Shadow Man and Ghost Rider, which happen to be the more supernatural guys anyway. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that's how I got my start was I just followed the passion that I had for horror. Very cool. And we do have Aaron joining us now. How's it going, Aaron, from uh, hey. what, eats, what feeds it? Yeah, sorry. I guess I was popping in and out there. Uh, I think it's working now. Thanks for having me on, guys. Happy Halloween. No worries. It is the uh, the pleasures of doing live online programming. We are at the mercy of the internet gods. So anything could happen. It's exciting. Um, so we're just asking everybody kind of what got you guys into comics and specifically horror comics, whether it's what you were reading or what you how you started creating. Um, with horror of, uh, you know, I'm one half of the writing team, uh, my other friend, Max Hoven and I, it eats. And for him and me, we're big fans of movies, actually. Um, you know, Alien, Return of the Living Dead and things like that. We uh, we kind of like watching bad horror movies at times as well. So anything that kind of has that fun theme is always kind of hit us in a way. And that's something we tried to do with our comic. Bad horror is something special. Like there's something about uh, the horror genre that when it's bad, it makes it better than, I don't know, other genres that that when they're faltering a little bit. Um, what about uh, Brian? What about you? Yeah, uh, so I think Joe and I, similarly, my, my first comic I ever read was a Ghost Rider and Werewolf by Night book. Um, and then I just sort of ran with that forever. Um, so the first book I worked on was a, a self-published short um, called Big White that was sort of like a alien, but starring a tow truck driver, just sort of like a bleak future sci-fi horror thing. And then Grid is sort of a, a campier you know, you know, blood and guts mess of a book. But yeah, I, I think that it's just, it's such a fun genre and the medium works so well for it that it's, it's, you know, it, it's been my thing all along and sticking with it. Awesome. Uh, Jordan, how about you? Um, um, well, I got in comics who were using Kicker to crowdfund their own and I got involved with you a website, like Hellraiser in one of my absolute favorite series. I've got like all 300 people. Though I've done them in different genres, like I seem to kind of come back to horror with, hmm. with my stories at some point. I love that. You always got to come back to it. So Brian kind of hinted at this, but what, and again, this is for everybody. What is different about horror in comics than in other mediums? Um, so in a movie, you, you can, I, you can create tension with music. And... <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go. Yeah, Joe, we'll, we'll, ahead. we'll go Joe and then we'll go to Joe. <laughs> Okay. Am I frozen now? I can't no, I, I think you're good. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, the the horror genre in comic books is is less of a you can't create those necessarily those jump scares, but you can create a, a sense of suspense and eeriness by choosing the the panels that you're leaving off on. Mm. Uh, Swamp Thing's a great example of you know masterful. Uh, visual storytelling that creates something ultimately like horrifying, uh, especially in the Alan Moore run and everything like that, where you're dealing with some really dark stuff like incest and uh, demonic possession and all the, you know, people are tripping out and seeing horrible things. Uh, but um, yeah, and so I, I sort of play on that. Uh, you, you can also get pretty grotesque and in comic books, which is, I think, a thing that appeals to me. Um, I like slasher films. I'm, I'm not a snob about it. I like, I, I love Hereditary, but I also love Freddy Krueger. You know, it's like you can have some cerebral stuff. You can have some jackhammery, hit you over the head, blood and guts stuff too. <laughs> and that's the great thing about the the comic book version of uh, of horror is that you get. You can really play up the suspense and have the over-the-top gore, and it still it it's, it doesn't get dumbed down. Really, it's still intelligent that way. 
And the over the top gore can be so stylized, right? And it just really adds to the feel yeah. and the environment. You mentioned Hereditary, and I that movie. I have a pretty high tolerance for horror. That movie scarred me. That movie's messed up. Um, if you haven't seen it, I, I, I don't even know if I could recommend it. But uh, <laughs> it's 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 uh, bone bone shaking. Um, Jordan should be on everybody's Halloween list this year. If you haven't seen it, you're not doing yourself a favor. It is incredibly effective. That is for sure. Um, Jordan, I didn't mean to cut you off there. What, uh, how, for you, how are horror comics different than other horror mediums? Uh, I think I was going to say you don't have music, which are not in a lot of movies. But, um, age term, I guess that's there is you build up anticipation to have waiting for this pretty terrifying on the next page. I guess that's kind of what we do. And um, like the other saying, kind of building slightly maybe and really building up a, a an atmosphere of the page. The eyes as well. I think I, I spent about a month in my bedroom that one. Yeah, so it, it, when you're reading a horror novel, you saw you have that anticipation of the page turn, but with the comic, you have that visual element. It's like not only am I going to read, what am I going to read, but what am I going to see? What are my eyes going to be assaulted with? Um, I definitely felt that when I was reading Grit a little bit. <laughs> Some of those uh, panels, the the gorier panels, it's excellent. Um, gentlemen, uh, Aaron and Brian, anything else that you want to kind of add, like that makes the comic medium uh, specifically special to you guys? I think everybody's talked about the page turn and sort of the interesting ways that you can use it. And it's such a specific medium because you can just sort of plan based on these, even in odd pages. And mm -hmm. it, it there's a significant impact to that. Um, I also think there's a lot of interesting ways you can misdirect with that because anticipating scene transitions with page turns, I just sort of, I'm an obsessive outliner. So I just have notebooks and notebooks numbered <laughs> one to 22. <laughs> and um, I, I just figure out which way best to play with these. I mean, you talked about some of the like, gory stuff in, in grit and I always try to line it up so you you sort of get a sense of the reaction to the thing before you see the thing mm -hmm. and I think that's the same way that a lot of like movies play that trope um, I, I just I recently reread The Marquee and I think it's one of those series that does it just like masterfully where a thing just gets progressively more grotesque the more pages you turn mm. Aaron, the for It Eats What Feeds It the page turn is even a little bit different because we have this thing that we don't even know what it is right yeah um as far as comparing it with movies like a, a few people have said you don't have music you don't have those cues to kind of guide where things are going so mm -hmm. you end up relying on your artist and wanting to kind of lay that atmosphere and setting with it eats we wanted you to feel the swamp right away so that you pretty much know you're in a horror story Mm -hmm. And everything else is going to line up with it as well. And uh, it, even though it's not a movie, you can still kind of do the same sort of things that play, though. And um, it's always kind of what you don't see that scares you and keeps you on edge. And with the comic, you can purposely have that extra time to linger across a panel. And you're thinking, is, you know, is that going to come into play like I think? And it, it builds suspense in a great way. One of the things at Pop Culture Classroom that we're all about is using comics for education. Um, and we always say that there's a really big um, uh, there's a big lift that the reader is doing when they're reading comics because they have to pick up on all the clues. They have to put together what's going on between the panels. And so in a film and when you're watching a scary movie, you can have that music like someone mentioned that, you know, kind of clues you into that something's going to jump out. Something's going to happen. But in a comic, if you're not doing that cognitive lift, if you're not putting all those pieces together, then it has a little bit more potential to take you by surprise. Um, and I know that I really enjoyed that when I was reading y'all's work. So uh, before we get into your individual comics, last question, what inspires you to create these types of stories, these sometimes twisted and violent and bloody uh, stories? Uh, for me, it's pretty organic. Uh, you know, I'll have a general interest in something. I'll do a deep dive on research. Usually it has some sort of historical thing to it. I tend mm -hmm. to go that way. Mm. And then uh, you don't even know how many times I, and I'm sure these guys will tell you the same thing. I've written whole books and thrown them away. 
you know, because I'm just like, oh, it didn't quite do what I was looking for it to do. I've rewritten openings like 20 times. Uh, but there's always like lo- one little piece that sticks and it carries you, it carries the story and it, it, it comes back in to the, the finished product that I end up making. So I, I think I rewrote like Infernal Pact, which was my first self-published book, like three times, maybe 10 times for Cherry Blackbird, which was the second. And then with Electric Black, I have a writing partner. Mm-hmm. So we, we basically have these conversations every morning for like almost an hour kicking ideas back and forth until something like hits and we're like, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to write about next. So that, that's a lot more, it's quicker for me because you got another mind to, to link up with and sort of like direct where we're going to uh, follow this path. But um, yeah. The electric black is cool. And that all of the different, uh, individual items within the shop each have their own history. And so I love how that also kind of propels the story along and um, kind of the, the individual stories seem to to inspire the story as the whole, which is very cool. Well, when we when we started this thing, it was very much going to be Tales from the Crypt. And mm-hmm. then once we actually laid out the first issue, we were like, do we want to make Tales from the Crypt or do we want to make like this cool story that we've been like, you know, because you don't have to tell the audience the like what your characters are all about, but you should always be thinking about who they are, how they would talk, what their likes are, what their dislikes are. You make like a character Bible. Mm-hmm. You never have to explain that to anybody. But once we did that for our, you know, our crypt keeper, which is Julius Black, we were like, this is way cooler than like all this other side stuff. So we kind of did away with the horror anthology portion. We still tap into it, but it plays a much larger role later on in the book. Mm, yeah. Uh, and just a reminder for all of you guys watching live, you can be submitting your questions right now. We will get to those questions at the end of the panel. Uh, but for the rest of you gentlemen, what else is going on, going on in your heads that inspires these, these twisted stories? Um, for it eats and for myself, uh, I have a writing partner, so it's very similar to what he was saying and that, um, it can go faster and that you have somebody to bounce ideas off with mm. Max and I, both of us, um, we kind of make the running joke that we think up openers all the time. And then there's only one opener out of the hundred that we thought of. It's actually really cool. And it might have that little inkling of something where we can build a story around it with it eats. Um, the biggest jumping off point for the whole thing was we were like, wouldn't it be kind of wild if somebody had to slide raw meat through a slot in the <laughs> attic door and they didn't know why pig heads. And then we'll just kind of, yeah, flesh things around that and uh, build our supernatural universe. So a lot of it is just um, us having so much fun coming up with ideas, honestly. And if something's good or it takes a little bit and then it clicks a little further, that satisfaction of pushing it and having it turn into something really great. It's, you know, creating the work is amazing. It's mm-hmm. fun. Yeah, I think with horror, it's easy to, like, find these scenes that you build backwards from. Um because they're the memorable moments in the stories. Like you usually, I feel like every issue has like a turn or two where Mm -hmm. you're just sort of like, those are the defining moments of it. And the reverse engineering and writing horror is a lot of fun because you have these like big images and then you're like, okay, well I have, I mean, like Joe said, you've got a cast of characters, you know how they behave, how would they navigate the situations you're putting them through to get them to the story you're trying to tell. Um, Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting in that you can tell some like poignant stories through horror, but also it's a different sort of escapism and it's this grotesque otherworldliness. Um, like some people might turn to like straight high fantasy for that, but I think a lot of people also like horror for the, the sort of like, well, like the world on fire. Yeah, it is, you know, everything's a mess, but like at least a ghost isn't messing with me right now. All right. So let's read about that. <laughs> Jordan, what about you? Um, well, for Frank, it's a bit of a rant. I remember I was watching the Richard Lee film after uh, Sunrise, it was like a romantic drama. It's just a really random, um, a Belgian acting to the about a play that he's performing where he plays a cow that, a cow that likes the table, smokes, and reads the paper. Gable con. Uh, coming back to him and going on there, there was weird stuff going on there. Um, 
and it pretty much came out of a um, yeah romantic drama. That's awesome. I, 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 do, I lost a little bit of that, but I think I heard a, a cow sitting at a table smoking and reading the newspaper, um, which <laughs> definitely sounds like it could be some inspiration for some fun stuff. Um, Jordan, I apologize. We have a slightly poor connection with you. So for our audience and our listeners, it's not you. It is our connection here. Um, hopefully we can get that getting a little bit stronger as we go. But what I would like to do now is I would like to give each of you guys an opportunity to talk about your own individual books and your creation process with that. We have a few visuals to go with that as well. So, Joe, we'd like to start with you and talk about um, kind of more in detail. What is your process for The Electric Black and how did you create that comic? With help, of course. <laughs> um, so, the yes, yeah, uh, The Electric Black actually, um, I was doing these self-published uh, horror graphic novels it was supposed to be the next one in the set that i was working on when um i quit my day job as an engineer to become a full-time comic book creator mm. um i'm not just a writer i'm also the artist of the electric black along with rich and um so i i pitched he wanted to work with me on a book together and um i had this idea kicking around about um this this vortex dimension where all these cursed objects were and that there was going to be this horror host and it was an, initially a, a different character altogether that i had already made but as me and rich started working together on it we decided that it was important that he have just as much stake in this process as i do and he's a very accomplished artist himself so he started flushing out uh what became julius black uh, you know, he threw an image at me. I threw something back. And then so he was the first creation we came up with. And he's he's like the proprietor of the electric black. So if you don't know what it is, it's about a cursed antique shop that exists outside of time and space. And it appears to people that it wants to corrupt or devour. And so um, for the first four issues, which have come out already, um, you're following the exploits of this shop as it's delivering these objects uh, around the world to different folks and in different spaces of time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we, the other day, the electric black presents number one just came out because we have a lot of backstories on some of these characters. And that one we actually are telling in a very tales from the crypt style where you get two stories. It's hosted by Julius black. Mm -hmm. And he tells okay. you uh, a little, like a little 10 page story about one of the characters that works for, or is involved with the shop. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of how it all started. And like I said, we, when we initially, um, started working on the book, it was, uh, it was supposed to be more of an anthology, but then we, we, de we developed these really rich characters. So there still is an anthology style to it, but, uh, these cursed objects that you're seeing that, that we're unveiling through time, uh, are part of this larger, battle between light and darkness and um plays on some tropes that people like like there's a chainsaw wielding lady that wears people's faces <laughs> we've got yes there jack, is <laughs> who, uh the, the this character jack anybody that reads an issue will tell you it's it's jack the ripper because mm -hmm. it's jack the ripper uh he's like an employee there uh there, there's julius there's erebus uh so yeah i i don't want to ruin it for anybody but the the trade is out uh the new series is starting so if you want to pick those up they're available now and it's under um through scout comics myself and rich woodall are the co-publishers of an imprint called uh black caravan so this was part of our initial launch along with the book phantom star killer which i'm the artist for rad so and now, will we be getting more of the Electric Black proper, or are we getting the uh, – I'm sorry, what did you say the, the spinoff series was called? Uh, the Electric Black Presents. The Electric Black Presents, yeah. Screen. Yeah. So there's two issues for that that we crowdsourced because we have amazing artists that came on and drew those two issues. We've got Paul Pelletier, who's done work on The Incredible Hulk and The Avengers and Justice League. I think he's the current artist on Batgirl or something. Uh, he does those Walmart comics of Batman as well. He he's he's done everything, uh, and then the other artist is Walter Osley, who's the artist for Metal Shark Bro and Has Haxor, the uh, Webtoons comic. For issue two, we got Carl Moline from uh, he he was the guy that co-created Frey with Joss Whedon, and he drew Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the comic book. 
and uh, Christian Dabari, who is a renowned horror comic book artist. He's worked on several books for Top Cow. He's going to be releasing some new material with us as well. And he does conceptual design for some Hollywood stuff. So really cool stuff. So those two issues are done. They're coming out uh, respectively. Uh, issue one just came out. Issue two comes out in December. Issue three comes out uh, early next year. Uh, and that one's being illustrated by me and Rich. And uh, that'll be the end of the Electric Black Presents series. Those are all the background stories. Then we okay. go back to the the regular series. Excellent. Okay. I really enjoyed the first four issues of the Electric Black, but I have not gotten to the Electric Black Presents yet. So I'm really excited to get some of those spinoff series while we wait for the main series to, to continue. That's awesome. Um. All right. We are going to go over to, uh, br sorry, we're going to go over to Aaron uh, to talk about It Eats What Feeds It. Okay, um, if you don't know about it, it eats what feeds it. Um, it's a grimy horror romance in the Louisiana Bayou. Um, it's made by myself. Max Hoven, writers, our artist and letterer and colorist and all-around all-star is Gabriel Yumazark. Um, and the process of bringing it together, we had reached out to Gabriel about wanting to work with him. We had a different story. It wasn't It Eats. Um, we didn't end up working on that one together, but Gabriel, you know, kind of gave us a nod and told us some things he might be interested in making that he'd like something possibly in a supernatural sense. So then Max and I kind of got to the grind of um, trying to come up with something along those lines, fit everything more in that world and make a horror story. And like I would said before, it, a lot of it jumped off with um, a slot that he had to slide raw meat through and working backwards from there. So our story ends up being about um, our lead, Kenny. He is taking a job as a, a caretaker, a property man ma manager at a, um, a rather spooky Louisiana Bayou. He's mansion. dropped out of school, and, right? Um, yeah, he's a, a young adult. He's not planning on college route. And yep. instead, he's walking into a, um, a rather sweet gig for him. You know, a good pay, a, a very attractive owner um she seems into him or at least he he wants her to be the job seems to have some perks for him yeah yeah it's almost <laughs> like it's um the golden job for him at his age and a lot of people that are checking the story out i think they understand a lot of his motives and francois is very uh, alluring and interesting and you want to know more about her and see more about her so uh you know he's going to find out that there's something behind this attic door and there's a, a lot more going on in this mansion than uh first meets the eye pretty much. So when you are going from your, your process of writing the script and then transforming that into the panels, are you, when you guys are creating this, do you kind of do that all at once? Do you start with just the script and then start your, your thumbnails and planning out how you want the pages to look? How does that work for you? Well, since there's two writers, Max and I are always kicking things back and forth. And then one of us will do a draft before sending it to the other. And it kind of goes back and forth in that manner until we have something we think is good enough to give to Gabriel. Um, and then the entire process was always um, changing. We were always taking in input from Gabriel or any new things we thought of that might work. We told Gabriel from the jump, you're our director. So, you know, <laughs> I if like we that. put things in the script that you can that you can tighten, um, things that you can, you know, strengthen with a better angle or honestly a different concept where it might be two panels that, you know, he's able to merge. So everything's teamwork along those lines. And then uh, working through all the actual script pages, uh, sketches, and then moving on to putting down inks and colors and everything once it feels a little more solid and rounded out. Now, what one thing that we do at Pop Culture Classroom as well is we create um, a comic line called Colorful History, uh, which I get to work as a little bit of a, an editor on. Um, and I've seen a million different styles of scripts for comics, right? It seems like every creator has their own style. And some of them are very they talk a lot about what they envision the art looking like. Uh, whereas some writers that I've worked with have leave that much more up to the artist. What's kind of, because one of the things that strikes me so much about it feeds is the art style and the cinematic sense. It almost to me reminds me of like an old school Disney animation, but of course much more creepy um, or even a little bit of like that anime quality to it. So is that, um, is that something that you guys think about when y'all are writing or is that coming more from your artist? 
It's a combination of both. Um, with working with Gabriel, there was past work of his that we were able to reference and say mm -hmm. that we kind of like those styles. Um, Gabriel had a long run of doing very, very attractive women as an art run for a while. <laughs> and his style is so, um, it's so dynamic while still being minimalist and everything. So we knew we were going to get that no matter what. With trying to guide him, it's more of letting him know the setting and environment that we feel, because if the setting and the characters are there, then the tone is what makes the horror drive. And so it's letting him know we want it to essentially kind of feel like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. If um, the pages that we've sent in between like the first versions, that for you have it up now. That it's gorgeous. Um, that's the first time Gabriel's going through. And then when you go to the next one, it ends up being more of an actual kind of traditional word. It's not as bright of colors. We told them to, to put more fog on and strengthen that tone and setting right away. But uh, we, we told Gabriel, you're the director. <laughs> if there's anything that we don't like in a panel or you were to miss something that does matter, we're going to let you know, but it's all teamwork because he's taking the you know the bare bones that we're giving them and he's fleshing it out and we see what works the whole way it's all a, a collaborative process honestly like even with those pages at the end um it's just little things gabriel puts a fold in the paper mm. and we tell him how about we flip that back down for the fool but within the whole process of it when we originally wrote the internet gods strike again Oh, man. OK, um, hopefully we'll get Aaron back or hopefully this is just a little freeze. Um, but the first I have read the first two issues of it eats what feeds what it what feeds it. And then they just released the third issue uh, the other day, which is available now in comic book stores. And I believe soon on the website. Um, really, really great stuff. So definitely go check that out. So let's go over to uh, Brian and talk a little bit about grit. You mentioned earlier the campiness of grit. And that is one of the things that I love about um, your characterization, the characters there. So how did uh, the whole idea of that series, how did that all come to be? Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so Grit is what we build as a Southern Fried Sword and Sorcery series. Um, <laughs> I love that. We, we didn't go in with the intent that it was a horror story, and it just kind of made its way there. Um, but yeah, it's it's just my love of like pulp fantasy heroes and um, kind of... I wanted to spend three issues knocking him down a peg. So I took, <laughs> I took my Conan or my Fafford and Grey Mouser and just sort of ran him through the ringer with a partner who is sort of aggressively anti-violent. Hmm. Um, and I thought it'd be a fun juxtaposition to have people like that forced to work together um, because they both think they know the right way to solve every problem. Yeah, yeah, and the, you don't get to see her until issue two, um, and so it's a great that you have the whole first issue to kind of like set up um, your your main character and this cultist thing that he's going into, and then all of a sudden issue two it all changes a little bit with the addition of his kind of foil. Yeah, yeah. So issue one is is like a straightforward action comic and sets up this sort of infallible hero, and then issue two very quickly establishes him as just sort of a curmudgeonly old man who's doing his job. Um, and I thought that was an interesting way to like twist the genre a little bit is to play it straight. And then right from the get go with issue two, it sort of becomes this campy comedy thing around why this grumpy old dude is, is maybe not actually the hero that I, I set him up as. Yeah. Yeah. I like where, uh, where it leaves off at the end of the third issue. I'm really excited to, to read some more of that. One thing that ties together, um, you know, Joe's work on the electric black and what you do here, or the first issue of grit is the cult scene where they're performing a ritual, but you have the co comedic elements of all the back characters kind of providing the comedy around like this ridiculous satanic or, or cultish ritual. And it's like, is it working? Is it working? Do we know yeah. if it's working? <laughs> and then they're surprised when it works. So right. um, they're like, oh God, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin, Kevin, uh, Kevin Castanero is the artist on the series. Uh, he's fantastic. And we work very, very, very closely together. Um, he said that I knocked a bucket list item off because two guys get their heads bunked together in a fight they scene. <laughs> and it was like, all right, well, I'm done. I don't have to draw anything else ever again. <laughs> yeah, they're very <laughs> understated. Just like, let me take care of this. Moving yeah. on. Yeah, it's great. Um, 
so with that one, where, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, be too obvious as to like, where is it going? But um, how you, you mentioned how the series has kind of evolved thus far. What are kind of like some thematic evolutions that we might see in the future? Yeah. So we, we have, you know, it, it ends on a note that I think some people were surprised to see it end on because we do set up some heroes and then do some wacky stuff with them mm-hmm. and they end up in uh, interesting places um, and, and going their separate ways. So we're actually accidentally following in Joe's footsteps and we're taking a step aside uh, with our next issue and um, we'll be exploring Again, just running with a throwaway joke, we mentioned The Revenant in the Wine Cellar in issue one in a passing comment, and mm-hmm. we're doing a one-shot about The Revenant in the Wine Cellar oh, now. Oh, excellent. Um, Barrow's not even in it. It's just about another character. Um, we have this sort of drunkard zombie um, who's like painfully self-conscious about being a zombie. So we're going to spend 22 pages with him before we get back to the main story. I'm here for that. I love when you get the world building. Uh, you know, the character development's great, but sometimes you got to learn more about the world to appreciate those characters and inhabit it a little bit more. Um, when can we anticipate that next issue? Uh, sometime mid next year. We're, okay. we're working out the kinks on what volume two is going to look like. Awesome. So, yeah. Rad. Um, and then our last one that we want to get to, uh, Jordan, for Frank at Home on the Farm, is not has not yet been released. And so I'm really excited to hear about this and hear what we can anticipate for, uh, for this series. Uh, can you guys hear me? You, you are cutting in and out a little bit, so we'll, we'll try and get as much of it as we can. Uh, from Farm is a story set after the First World War. Where um, the soul comes back to the front line to his family, fights for them, waiting for him to open arm. The farm completely empty, but the strange, mysterious kind of things on around there, and that starts to become more suspicion holes are up to and he's the creek on nearby where one sees from their family a bit of art have up green at the moment um based on the book Klein is when he came to what seems like a kind of nice shot run by an old lady that her husband was obsessed with me so that shot animals all around the top of the shop look at a thematic to what the series as a whole interesting and and so for this one if i am correct in my information it looks like this was this series was kickstarted is that correct Yeah, I did issue in Kickstarter, uh, and the yeah the exciting news of Scout getting in touch, like to put it in the direct one. will be coming out hopefully next month. Uh, artist is absolutely incredible, more and more like stunning, but also kind of crazy with every issue. The final chair it just is completely. Mad. Uh, and off the rails. Yeah, we can see a couple of the pages of that that Liz is displaying right now, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. So I am really excited to get to my hands on that. And I believe you said that this is starting monthly next month, right? Yeah, that's correct. Now starting end of November. Perfect. So remember, everyone, if you're watching at home, uh, I do see your questions here, and we are about to get to the audience Q&A portion. Uh, So thank you, Christopher and Ron, for submitting your questions already. And if you guys think of any more as we go, please uh, go for it. It can be a question for a specific creator. It can be a question for all of these guys, whatever you're thinking. So Christopher has uh, an interesting question, and this is kind of what 
that's a little different than than what I was thinking with the Kickstarter. Um, but Christopher is asking, how does the shift to digital impact the page turn aspect of your stories? Do you make adjustments to add or subtract story beats without a physical page turn? So I, I worked uh, on a actual web comic. I'm assuming this is what he's asking about, right? So with a web comic, you're you're scrolling it's a different format, up, yeah, right. So what we were doing was there was a drip and the drip was part of like this ghostly thing that was coming at you. So the drip actually would drop and would go down several pages as like the captions were moving. Ooh. So you get parts of the story as you're following the water coming down. That's one thing you can do with it. Uh, there are lots of great um, videos and tutorials you can find out about how to do web versus uh, traditional comics, mm. uh, but in the traditional comic medium transferring to web, uh, you know, there like comiXology has the, um, uh, what is it where, where you, it, it goes from one panel to the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forget what that's called. It's, uh, but anyways, it's their proprietary thing. Yeah. And that actually, uh, that helps quite a bit for guys like us. When really? It, it does create a little bit more suspense because you're, uh, yeah, it's called uh, Caption View or something like that. And basically, they oh, they go in and they digitally... Uh, yeah, Jordan, they, Guided they, View. Guided View. Uh, they go through and they, uh, you know, make it so you can only see one panel at a time. And I mean, it, it does the same thing that we're doing when we think about our page turns, but you get even more of a build that way. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to develop a whole book using Guided View, that would be cool, but I don't <laughs> think it would really... I don't think the the screen going down or you know the the up and down would really work for traditional comics at this point. We were talking to author Brian Fees. He wrote a graphic novel. I actually have a copy of it right here, uh, called A Fire Story, um, and it's a story of uh, his house burning down in the 2017 California wildfires. And it started as a web comic. Um, you know, the the night that his house burned down, he was like, I know I need to turn this story into a comic. And so he started as a web comic. One thing he mentioned was that he knew people would be viewing it on their phones. And so because of that, he intentionally made the text larger than he would for a traditional comic so that viewers who are seeing it on a small screen would be able to read it more easily, which I thought was fascinating. It's not something I would have ever thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's the whole thing. When you're making, if you wanted to make something that went from web to paper, mm -hmm. I think that's easily achievable. Uh, Rich has done that before. They used to have Artist Alley comics, so all their panels were like squares, mm. you know? Uh, and all you'd have to do is re-letter it, I guess, you know? But it, yeah, that's fascinating stuff. I'd, I'd be curious to check the book out. I read most of my comics digitally, so has the, the digital... I don't, I don't want to say revolution because that sounds cliche, but has the uh, prominence of digital comics changed any of y'all's work in any way? Um, for me in particular, no, I mean, I did try, you know, we did a pitch for webtoons, mm -hmm. um, which was an interesting experience. I did that with Walter Osley. Uh, that was last year. Uh, but ultimately I think there are just a lot of creators out there that want to hold a physical object. It even comes down to people still buy DVDs and vinyl records. Oh, I got because, all mine out there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's like saying, I don't know, people just put, a, if they can hold it in their hand, if they, and that's the whole thing too, the way that we print things, uh, you know, I went out of my way to find the right paper stock for our covers and stuff. And um, yeah, I, I just think that it's this visceral experience where you get to own it and possess it and you become part of that thing. So I, for me, it's, it, digital is great. If that's how you, if that's how you bring your media into your life, that's cool. But there's still a lot of collectors out there that make my life, uh, you know, make all the other side work that I care so much about mm -hmm. still valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like on the base level, it doesn't affect the way that I write a comic or present a comic. I think there are people doing really interesting things with it. But I, I do think that going in with the intention to utilize the format, I mean, the same way that we talked about the the pros of having a book where you flip pages, like just like Joe said about the water dripping, um, Ryan Katie did a great book called um, Wolf, uh, Wolfsbane on Webtoon. And 
a vertical werewolf transformation scene is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> because just like a, a way that I never would have thought to present this, this scene um, mm -hmm. in just like one continuous, grotesque, really, really long panel. So I think it's an interesting thing. And it's something that I'd probably want to mess with at some point, but I, I don't think that it's impacted the way that like traditional comic work has functioned. So here at PCC, we are all about turning consumers into creators, right? How, how do you become a creator? How do you follow your dreams? Ron on Facebook, I'm going to condense your question just a little bit. Uh, Ron is asking, what are some pointers or tips on what makes a successful pitch? So when you are pitching a comic to a publisher or when you are trying to get it backed on Kickstarter, um, what are some things that you can do to make it successful? Um, well, follow the guidelines that the publishing company lays out for you because key. one of the first things that we do at Black Caravan is if you can't follow the simple instructions we put up there, your stuff goes right in the garbage because you can't follow instruction. Yeah, I mean, that that's a dead giveaway that you're not somebody I want to work with. Uh, second, be open to criticism from your editor. They know what they're talking about. Uh, we're all supposed to be like big people here and, and you know, criticism is part of getting to be better. You mm -hmm. might think that this is the greatest thing you've ever done, but there's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly taking advice from my peers and from other editors. And, you know, I have a guy who works on video games who edits all my books. If he tells me to do something, he's not doing it to be a jerk. He's doing it because he's giving me sound advice that I need to follow. And it's for intelligent a better advice. Yeah. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me back up for a second. There are jerks out in the world that will try to hurt you. Um, but, but that should be apparent to you. Like if your hackles go up and you're like, there's something up with this guy like or this girl and she's just being mean to me for no reason, try someone else, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, you know, be prepared for rejection. Uh, not everything falls into everybody's cup of tea. And that's the other thing, too. Comic books are very subjective because a lot of it's based on two factors. One, we're looking at the writing. Two, we're looking at the art. And if one of the two doesn't jive with me or my partners, that's it. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It just doesn't work for the three guys that, that you know, make decisions at my company. Right. It just may not be right for that brand, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, so the first step that I tell everybody is just make it. Don't talk about it anymore. Make a product. If you're a writer, start writing. Finish your script. Don't like write two pages and be like, what do you think? No, write your story. <laughs> if you're an artist, draw a book, draw a whole book. And if you're a writer and you need an artist, go find that guy. And if you're an artist and you need a writer, go find that person too. You know, it, and if you can do both, that's awesome. <laughs> Just do it. I love that. Just so be, be, be open to feedback. <laughs> um, yeah. Trust your gut, be open to feedback and follow directions. What else? Anything else? Can't you follow guys? directions. Game over. Jordan, Brian, anything to add to that? What makes a successful pitch? Yeah, the professional letter, I reckon, is a good one. The people always think about lettering. They can say that if you letter, then that can often. Um, yeah, I, be concise. Um, like, like Joe said, man, it's, it's, it's a business working relationship. Like mm -hmm. be a person that people want to work with. <laughs> like it's, it be a nice normal person and don't, don't approach every conversation about everything you write as if it's your magnum opus, because <laughs> you're going to keep making stuff mm -hmm. ideally. Um, so, you know, like he said, finish stuff, just get, get work done, get it out into the world. Um, my like 12 page short self-published thing opened a lot of doors and got me in touch with a lot of people. Just do a thing. Um, no one's stopping you from making a comic. So just make a comic <laughs> and be prepared to fail too. That's okay. It, the difference between people that make it and people that don't is people that make it have tried and they've failed. We, we've all failed. Bunch Joe, of <laughs> Joe, are you saying that they they need to have a level of grit to succeed? Hey. That's right. <laughs> hey. I see what you did there. Nice. 
Um, one thing that I've always heard, and let me know if you guys agree with this, is that you, you when you start out creating things, make it for yourself. Don't make it to please other people. Make something that you would want. Is that something that you would agree with? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, it, if you're not in love with it, you're, you're going to hate doing it. If you mm -hmm. want to draw superheroes, don't draw horror stuff. <laughs> if you want to draw horror stuff, superheroes might not be your thing. It's okay. I think, uh, Neil Gaiman might disagree with you in uh, the first volume of Sandman, but <laughs> this is true. He really, he, but then it he evolved was doing some there. interesting <laughs> stuff back then, though. And and honestly, his books beforehand, they didn't know what to do with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was putting out he was putting out comics that you know I've collected some of his early work that he was doing with Dave McKeon, and they didn't know how to classify it. It wasn't necessarily a comic book. It wasn't like anything anybody had seen before, and maybe. One of your listeners right now is making that exact thing, something that nobody knows how to classify yet. And yes, make it. It may not make be it. everybody's cup of tea, but make it for you and f you will find the people for it, right? Um, yep. And then we have one more question from YouTube. This one, Brian, is specifically for you. Uh, and I apologize. I hope I say this correctly because I'm unfamiliar with this title. Uh, what, if any, influence was Mignola's BPRD on grit? Um. I mean, it, it's no, it's, I have, I've got like a Hellboy page framed behind me. Um, <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a huge Hellboy guy and BPRD guy. I love these sort of condensed supernatural stories. Um, and I think that's what I set out to do is a lot of the like BPRD stuff over the years have been these supernatural slice of life stories. And that's sort of the length uh, that that's my ideal length of comic. I think I really love a three or four issue thing that I can tear into and have a beginning, middle and end. Um, so yeah, I, I just sort of wanted to explore. Yeah, I, I think maybe tonally it's an influence. I, you know, Hellboy stuff gets goofy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not, I, I mean, I think people might classify it as a horror book, but I don't know. It's pretty funny and charming. And I, I think there's a way to do a lot of that in a lot of different genres. So yeah, I think that this was just a way of taking a whole bunch of stuff that I love and mashing it together. And I definitely do love um, BPRD and Hellboy books. I mean, like Joe said, it's all about just blending together the stuff that you love and feel passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, I made this because I like pulp stories and I wanted to have fun with one. You know? Yeah. So. All right. Well, uh, before we finish up, I have some rapid fire questions for you guys. These are questions that we are asking all of our guests today. Just some fun Halloween stuff. So first, and we'll go uh, for each of these, we'll, just to get through them, we'll go Joe, Brian, Jordan. Um, so first of all, do you prefer spooky vibes or like scary, terrifying? Scary, terrifying. Okay. Spooky. Scary, terrifying. Okay. Yeah, I for me, I like the scary, but it's got to be once in a blue moon every now and then. Uh, do you prefer zombie stories, zombie media, or ghost and haunting stories? Ghost and haunting. Ghost. Ghost as well. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm the odd man out here. I'm a zombie dude. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite horror property, whether it's a movie or a video game or a book or a comic? That's not fair, man. There's too much. <laughs> Uh, in the last five years or so, uh, Hereditary is up there. I also like It Follows. Midsummer was great. Oh, I like that. All it that Follows stuff. is one of my favorites. So good. Yeah. Hellraiser. Okay. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, I guess like uh, on I always love the Nightmare on Street films. Okay, Nightmare on Elf Street, the classics. Uh, on our last session, I said the novel of It. So this time I'm going to mix it up and go video game um, and uh, The Last of Us Part 1 and 2. Those are some stellar games. Uh, and then finally, what is your favorite Halloween costume that you have ever put together? Um, I, I've done Jason. I, I'm, as much as I love horror and Halloween and all that stuff, I, I'm pretty much Jason, like 90% of the time. So. <laughs> in, in real life? Uh... No, no, no. That's just like the costume I go to. I'm an incredibly <laughs> lazy. Uh, you know what? I, I was the wolf man one year, and that was an awesome costume. I like jumped around like a dog and everything. It was great. Joe walks up <laughs> behind you, and you hear the tss, 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 tss. <laughs> Brian? Oh, man. Uh, when you have a beard, it's really difficult to find Halloween costumes um, because you're pretty limited. Uh, so I usually just go with stupid stuff. Um, my favorite one has been Rad Serling, uh, black suit, skateboard, slice of pizza. 
I love that. Uh, Jordan? Um, probably my favorite was a really kind of homemade John from Alien. I always speak, but I managed to kind of wedge through a hole in the white uh, <laughs> below the red paint. Probably best. Oh, man. Uh, gentlemen, if you're not doing anything later, I need you to upload some photos of these using hashtag pop scream. And everybody watching and listening, you can do the same. Upload your favorite Halloween costumes using hashtag pop scream. And if you scroll through those or in between panels, we're showing those. And you can see me as Lady Gaga uh, from 2009. One of my finer works that I'm, I'm quite proud of. Uh, thrift store, wedding dress and everything. It was excellent. <laughs> Um, well, friends, before I let you go, one last chance to promote your work. Where can people find it? We'll go in the same order. Uh, so Black Caravan books are all available through Scout Comics. Uh, our current line, I think both books are sold out right now. Uh, both Electric Black Presents and Phantom Starkiller. I'm not 100% on Electric Black Presents, but I know it got reordered. So it could be sold out. I don't know. But if not, you can find it on Scout uh, comics.com or go to your local comic book store and subscribe to all things black caravan there you go that's my pitch and you can find it digitally as well and i can i know that's how i read it yes. over the week yeah yes cool uh you can find me at bm wickman all over the internet uh, my website is just brianwickman.com i've got grit stuff plus all my other older stuff up there um go find grit in shops the second printing of issue two just dropped last week um there's copies around scout has some or they may not <laughs> <laughs> you've sold out a co are you in third printing now or second printing we're on, we're on second printing for issues one and two um uh i know that scouts still got issue three issue three might be easier to find the whole series is out the trade's coming in february uh oh, we're actually. soliciting in december um a bunch of cool stuff in the trade we'll do three extra stories that weren't in the single issues bunch of cool pinups and stuff um, i'm sold <laughs> go read everybody's stuff forever comics are great i agree uh and then jordan where can we find frank on the farm when it comes out uh frank should be all good starting november you can get in the very very um yeah just in general i'm always releasing new stuff on kickstarter so uh keep an eye on me jordan thomas kickstarter or jordan j thomas on twitter to see the, the next coming out Perfect. Um, well, guys, I really cannot thank you enough for joining us today, educating our audience a little bit, letting us know about your awesome titles. Um, so again, thank you. I hope everyone watching and listening enjoyed this. We have even more great content coming throughout the day. Our next panel is going to start in half an hour and contains even more literary goodness um, as Tajan and I are going to chat with author Stephen Graham Jones, um, author of Mongol, Mapping the uh, sorry, Mongrel, Mapping the Interior, and the Only Good Indians. And check out the schedule, which will be right after this stream to see all the other things that we have planned for today. But the fun doesn't end once today is over. The Pop Stream team has new content every week that you can enjoy live or on demand. So make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash popstream. Turn on the notifications, give us a like. And if you would like to learn more about the nonprofit that uh, runs this pop culture classroom and also puts on Denver Pop Culture Con, our mission is to inspire a love of learning, increase literacy, celebrate diversity, and build community through the tools of popular culture and the power of self-expression. So you can learn more about our organization and donate at popcultureclassroom.org. All donations go to programs such as creating our history-based comic series, Colorful History, creating teaching guides for graphic novels and helping students read using graphic novels, providing scholarships to camps and workshops, and providing free and low-cost workshops at schools, libraries, and community centers in the Denver metro area. So thank you again to Scout Comics for providing all of you guys for us um, and all the amazing creators here. And I will see all of you guys in the audience in half an hour with Stephen Graham Jones. Take care, guys. 